name is Karen Hill, and I'm in Victoria, and today is April 5th, 1984. Uh, this is the Oral History of Social Work in Canada Project, a project of the Canadian Association of Social Workers. Today I'm interviewing Mrs. Claire McAllister, who's had experience in social work uh, in several places across Canada. Mrs. McAllister, in order to get started, I wonder if you might tell us when and where you were born, and a little bit about your early life. I was born in Nelson, in the Kootenay part of British Columbia. In December of 1906, so I'm past 77 years old now. Uh, Easterners, of course, never know that there are five mountain ranges between the coast range and the Rockies. The Kootenai is about the fifth. Uh, my parents were pioneers in the Kootenai. My father was joined by my mother and an older brother a week before the railway went into Rossland. I always thought that was a fascinating. She went up by stagecoach. One might have thought she could have waited for the first train to go into the Rossland mining camp. So I was uh, full of uh, stories of the, of the early days and the neighborly kind of uh, community. My father was active in uh, politics as a conservative. Uh, he died as the mayor of Nelson in the influenza epidemic of 1918. I was interviewed recently by someone doing a history of that epidemic <laughs> across across Canada. But the pioneer communities, my father had one of the first cars in that country and uh, one often visited uh, farms and mines and so on, so you knew a great, uh, a great variety of people. All the little pioneer communities, of course, were going to be, each one was going to be a metropolis and they all had an opera house. It was wooden, but uh, still uh, they aspired to, <laughs> to culture. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, and uh, they, had, uh, they had libraries and all this, all this kind of thing. The current controversy in Nelson, I like getting involved in controversies about our, uh, our social credit BC government, which is inimical to many cultural things, killing a small university there. Uh, Hugh Keenerside was the, was the first chancellor there, David Thompson University. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps where, that's enough about that. Where were you during the, the Depression? Well, I, uh, I uh, had had a BA degree at, uh, at UBC and a postgraduate year in education, which uh, led to your being able to teach high school. I uh, taught for a couple of years and then uh, joined my husband in uh, three years in Cap Breton, 1930 to 33. Of course, the Depression struck. That was a very interesting experience. He was with a mining machinery company and, of course, the steel mill was down and the mines were down and uh, we were very lucky uh, that our fare was paid uh, back to British Columbia, our home province. So uh, my old son was, was born there and he came back to, uh, to Victoria. So that uh, <coughs> the bulk of the depression years were spent uh, here in Victoria. People often ask for your memories of the depression. Uh, I have many. One particularly was the horror of getting a load of wood. We all burnt, uh, I've uh, burnt uh, thousands of cords of wood, I suppose, in a lifetime. <coughs> Furnaces and fireplaces and kitchen stoves, but uh, the men would walk across town and follow a load of wood, bright hope in their eyes. Uh, Could I put in your wood, lady? And I'd say, oh, sorry, we have to do it ourselves. I'd do it for a dollar, lady. Sorry, 50 cents, and you couldn't even give them all a slice of bread because it would run out. Uh, one of the things I particularly mm -hmm. remember, of course, uh, many other things. Uh, we early became involved in uh, CCF politics uh, in the time of the, you know, the early days of the formation of the, of the CCF. Uh, I don't really want to get into that. Now, later on, I ran a couple of times for the CCF. Wait. That must have been early on, and it's when it was just beginning. Yes, yes. Uh, there were some people out here in British Columbia, uh, as I understand, who um, were in on the beginnings of that party. Did you have? Well, I particularly remember. I I know uh, Grace McGinnis very well uh, when she was a member of the legislature, and uh, Gretchen Steves and Laura Jemison, brilliant women, well educated, uh, all very much aware of, uh, of uh, social issues. Uh, uh, Gretchen Steves was uh, uh, born in Holland and had uh, 
a degree in law. Laura Jamison had been a juvenile court judge. And Grace McGinnis, the daughter of J.S. Woodsworth, uh, I once reported a session of the legislature. And, uh, these people, Colin Cameron, who later became an MP, Grace McGinnis later became an MP, but uh, he was being thrown out of the logging camps physically at the time. You know, here we are still with controversy in, in the logging camps, but one was very much aware of all the, uh, the issues, the work camps for the unemployed, uh, people quote on relief, and, and uh, the whole general social scene through the things that were being discussed by the people active in the, in the CCF at that time. At that time, was there um, discussion about social welfare goals as far as the CCF was concerned? <coughs> well, I don't... Uh, by the time I got actively into the CCF, I had two children born in Victoria. But later I became chairman of what we then called the District Council of the, uh, the CCF when we got past the Depression and, and into the war, you know, we, we got into social policy. But I think the principal social policy stress was um, um, that there should be adequate relief for people, and particularly the situation of the single men, which I'm sure you will have read about. I, I remember hearing one speech in the legislature, I think the most heartrending ever. I heard a man who had been a railway engineer and his maiden speech in the legislature depicting the, uh, uh, the uh, railway uh, police, whatever term was hung on them, knocking the knuckles of the man, knocking them off the freight cars. He was an engineer much aware of what was going on, mm -hmm. as a kind of, call it a cartoon image of the sort of horror of what was happening. Mm -hmm. One was much aware of what was happening to families by way of inadequate food. I find the same thing now. I am horrified with our government of reducing social assistance and knocking singles off social assistance when I look at the price of food. A liter of milk here costs 2% milk, a dollar and three cents now. And uh, the dried milk has gone up. Food prices are much heavier here than they are in, in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. I can't see how anyone can be feeding their children yeah. adequately. Yeah. I worry about old people. I'm in that group. Many of them are in it. But young children are making their teeth and their bones and their meat. And yeah. They yeah. need adequate food. So it's the same, the same issue as over again. Housing. Mm -hmm. Single men are knocked off social assistance here. And uh, they're supposed to go back to their parents. Um, who maybe are two old people on um, suddenly reduced social assistance without enough for two people to eat, let alone feeding Willie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, um, when war was declared, um, a member of the CCF, uh, J.F. Woodsworth, uh, was the only member in the House of Commons to vote against Canada. We Canada had a war. member in our legislature, Did and you? that was that same Colin Cameron, and I sat behind his wife. Uh, as he rose up and said the same thing uh, mm -hmm. that J.S. Woodruff. It was rather amusing about his wife. I knew them very well. She was a tall Scottish woman, very tall, and she sat in the front row right in front of me. Anybody who didn't know her would have thought she opposed his position. She was rocking herself back and forth with excitement, and she said, I hope they arrest him, I hope they arrest him. <laughs> and she really meant I'm willing for him to be a martyr in this, in this cause. I, I met her at a, a UBC summer school for seniors years ago, and she said to me, do you know, I can't remember that. I thought it was a strange thing for a wife to remember. <laughs> but that was Colin, uh, Colin Cameron, the fighting Scotchman. Yes. Did that kind of thing make, uh, that kind of event with Woodsworth and Cameron, make things difficult for you as a CCF member? Well, I don't know. I think uh, we admired people with, uh, in the case of J.S., one would call it a Christian con a conscience. I don't know whether Colin Cameron would have called it that. Just a, a reason <laughs> whether he was a Christian or not. He didn't talk about it, but, but uh, just a, a, a rational, uh, a rational decision. There certainly were those who opposed it, but I think even those who opposed it had a certain amount of 
admiration for people who would take this kind of stand. Mm -hmm. Colin certainly later got elected as an MP after he went into this legislature. Mm -hmm. One of the, the things that was so important that happened during the Second World War was the internment of the Japanese Canadians in British Columbia. Where were you and how were you affected? Well, uh, I'm affected by it in a, uh, a later kind of way because uh, uh, my oldest son is a scientist at the Pacific Biological Station, head of the ecology section. His wife is a Nissi, and her family were moved. Her father was a, a fisherman. Her family were were moved up into the uh, Caribou. I think they had a better time than some people. I had a friend who was uh, uh, teaching in Greenwood in the Boundary uh, Country after the war, but uh, I think all of us again respected our, uh, by then I guess it was still CCF people, I'm trying to remember myself, who uh, uh, again, the has uh, come very much to mind. Uh, I had friends who uh, who taught, uh, it was through the United Church to set up schools in the camps for the kids, uh, very close friends. Uh, one a man and one a woman, and I've met others uh, subsequently. And our feeling of uh, of shock was uh, was very great that this could happen to people, particularly uh, uh, that their valuable fishing boats and homes and personal things uh, could not only that they were deprived of them, but they were sold for you know ridiculous uh, prices. Uh, the whole whole kind of thing, and I think these things have left some um, um, some stain on uh, people, but my, what my daughter-in-law has told me about uh, where she was in Caribou, I think they were uh, perhaps a smaller group and mingled to quite an extent with the existing community. You know, you get different areas and different groups who went there and so on. Some experiences were worse than others. Mm -hmm. um, what happened after the end of the war? Were you still teaching school during that time? No, no. I, I was at home with my, with my children, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a divorced person, but I don't want to put that into the, into the uh, record. I did occasionally do a little uh, uh, substituting in, in teaching high school. I was uh, active in a number of groups in the community. A, a group that was very powerful at that time was called the Local Council of Women. I, I think they scarcely exist anymore. All the women's groups belonged and they had an annual hearing. They went to the legislature and so on. And I represented, I and another woman were the uh, CCF delegates to that uh, group. You know, there were a number of... Uh, Harry Cassidy was here. I have... Uh, <laughs> And then I knew a newspaper writer uh, gave me uh, a first edition of uh, Harry Cassidy's book after he reviewed it um, about the what was desirable in the welfare system. And um, it's interesting because the title on the title page was different than the title on the paper cover that you get on a <laughs> review volume. But uh, I lived near the, the Cassidy's when he was still here. And of course, what Harry, I was just a spectator at that time, what Harry did, uh, this was before I got into social work myself, uh, we had uh, separate people, say, for uh, what we now call old age security or child welfare or various kinds of legislation covering our extended landscape, like, say, going into the Chilco or something, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Harry uh, uh, reorganized it so that one person would be carrying carrying out uh, a variety of pieces of legislation. This was quite an extraordinary, I'm putting it in very crude terms, which mm -hmm. he'd be able to, to follow. He thought mm -hmm. this was more economic and, and more useful. I, it certainly shook up some of the people who were doing the jobs. They, you know, change is always very painful. Yeah. <laughs> they had their own little rut. To yeah. But uh, anyway, that, uh, that's worth remembering in the, in the social history of British Columbia that was Harry Cassidy. Make instituted that change, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And when when the war was over, what what did you do? Were you uh, 
Well, uh, during the war, uh, uh, as I say, ignore the divorce situation, but my personal situation changed. It happened that my my mother died in Vancouver, and um, I wasn't getting enough to maintain my three children, and I realized I would have to do something. And because I had been so much interested in social issues through the CCF, now housing was another thing. There are houses still along the waterfront here, 27 people in a rooming house using one bathroom, you know. Still uh, today? Oh, not now. The houses are still there. But, uh, <coughs> but this kind of, of thing, uh, the need of housing for families, the need of housing for older people, and other social issues. And uh, perhaps purely accidental, uh, <coughs> I, I met a friend on the train. She had, I was going up island, she had also been active in the, in the CCF. Her, her husband was with the control commission overseas on the continent. And uh, she had decided to go to the School of Social Work. And I thought, uh, uh, this is Gertrude Williams, <laughs> this Italian lady interviewed. If Gertrude is going to do that, why don't I? I could go over and use my mother's house, you see. Uh -huh. So uh, uh, that was how I happened. It was, I think, because of my political interest, uh, particularly in the wartime situation, uh, I went to the School of Social Work and uh, completed that course. It was still the wartime situation here in Victoria when I started. But I wanted to say something about the old diploma program because I think it was a scheme that might be useful for the future. There was the ordinary fall and spring term at UBC with a two days a week fieldwork placement. Mine happened to be in the Family Service Agency in Victoria, headed by Mary McFedrin, one of the early pioneers who came out from the East and set a very high standard of work. And uh, then, at the end of the spring term, you had a two months block placement. Mine happened to be in City Social Service down by Victory Square, where I met all the slums, uh, the Japanese and Chinese area, uh, all the old uh, Skid Road bums, quote, uh, a, a wonderfully varied experience. And then you went back and had a summer school. And it seems to me that this kind of arrangement, in, in the second placement, you got the day-to-day -day rhythm of the agency through the month, which you never get in a two days a week, mm -hmm. you know, the, the payday quote of, mm -hmm. of what was still being called relief then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I thought it was very productive. Then you went back and had the summer school. And it seems to me the kind of experience that uh, working people uh, might be able to take in fractions, you know, as compared with two years of a master's degree. Of course, we have the undergraduate programs now, which are very good too. But anyway, I found it a, a very useful, one, mm -hmm. a very useful experience. Then I came back here, and uh, if you want to be mixed with politics, I, I took a little time off uh, because I was rather tired uh, managing the children, and at the end of the summer, and then there was a BC election, so I ran for the CCF, you mm -hmm. see. All right, I, I didn't get in, which was expected. I had, I had run once before, once in Victoria and once in Oak Bay. The second time I ran in Oak Bay against a man who was the Minister of Finance, very much like the current government, and his utterance about the universities was, uh, we'll cut till it hurts and then cut to the bone. Oh. And so uh, naturally we expected Herbert Anscombe to get in. Well, after that I drew my breath and then uh, they were very short of trained uh, social workers, and uh, they uh, were advertising, uh, here's a nice anecdote for you, uh, uh, men uh, cleaners, uh, they weren't called janitors, they were called cleaners, uh, the requirements were uh, uh, a, knowledge of clean, a knowledge of English and cleaning methods, 125 a month, social workers with a degree and a postgraduate diploma, 115 a month. <laughs> That's true. We, we, cut, we cut out the ad and put it up on the walls of the School of Social Work. Well, anyway, there was a vacancy, so I applied. Uh -huh. And Griffiths, who was uh, uh, highly placed in, in the, in the uh, Provincial Social Welfare Department, or whatever it was calling itself, then called me in and said, Claire, I knew him quite well, you know, uh, 
the, the cabinet sat on this and uh, you won't be offered, a, you won't get a job here. But if you go to the city, they'll give you a job. Municipal people had their own staff at that time. It's not something that's very interesting. Thank you for telling me. And I went down. I knew a chap who was the chairman. We didn't have a just an informal organization of civil servants and not mm -hmm. a union. But I knew him through the NDP, and I sought him out in the depths. And I said, do you people want to take this up? I said, I have the stuff on them. Uh, he said, well, you go and talk to Harold Winch. Harold Winch was then the leader of the NDP. So Harold, very wisely said that he knew me well because I used to sit in on the, uh, on the uh, caucus when I was reporting for the paper. He said, you think about it today, Claire. So mm -hmm. I thought about it. So he raised it on the floor of the house. It was a brief wonder on the front page that I, they needed trained people, and I was refused a job because of my politics. So then, mm -hmm. uh, after this, uh, I didn't want to work for the city, and uh, with nothing but social assistance. The, the Children's Aid Society was brave enough to hire me, which was quite courageous of them, I thought. When would that have been, Claire? I can't tell you precisely. It's dreadful. It was about 1942, somewhere in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, uh, I picked up a caseload of about 300. Some of them were complaints of neglect six months old. You know, in the, in the post-war situation, uh, you were, uh, oh, there were returning people, illegitimate uh, children, uh, still a heavy population of people. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Things I found in my own city. Victoria never had visible slums. But uh, Lower Johnson Street with nice fronts is teeming with, with problems. I remember getting into some ethical situations there. Uh, uh, on request, the agency would do uh, uh, a Supreme Court judge, uh, custody of children, would request a report. And I raised the question with the agency of any protection for the social worker making the report, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, you sometimes got two parents, both of whom seemed the social worker perception scarcely, scarcely suitable, you know, uh, fighting uh, combat over the children. I remember one of the hotels uh, on called Lower Johnson Street, the, the man who uh, married again who was living with someone, said, oh, Mrs. McCaster, we only have nice married people in this building. <laughs> but uh, anyway, mm -hmm. that issue was never uh, settled of protection for social workers, mm -hmm. uh, the legal protection which lawyers and doctors and mm -hmm. other people have. I found getting into the laws of evidence very startling, although we'd had a, a course in the law in the diploma program that had give, been given by a series of lawyers. And when you have a case of battering in a rooming house and the other inhabitants keep phoning you, why don't you do something about that kid? We can hear the blows, we can hear the howls, I could go and see the bruises, and the lawyer would say, well, never hold in court, you've got to get better evidence than that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, mm -hmm. this kind of thing that yeah. you've got into. There are always things for which you're not adequately prepared by your training. Yeah. And that, uh, why? In the end, you learn some respect for the laws of evidence, but in the first place, when what seems to you at least possible and defensible is not good enough, it, you, you have kind of a sense mm -hmm. of... Who were some of your colleagues when you were working at the uh, Children's uh, Well, uh, uh, Mrs. Beatrice Skeets, who's well known to your hostess in, in the city, <laughs> was mm -hmm. on the staff there much longer, much longer than uh, than I was. Uh, the head of the um, of the uh, agency was a nurse. Uh, we operated under a board. Uh, to my taste. Uh, uh, may have uh, been wrong, but it seemed to me that she was uh, very, very slow in making the ultimate decision on the basis of evidence that a child should be apprehended. Or sometimes she seemed to make it, maybe having been worried herself because some of her decisions were very slow, rather precipitately. You know. But I was a raw recruit. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, another one, uh, let me think who else is, uh, is still around. 
Mildred Wright is in Vancouver. She was working for the Catholic Family Service in Vancouver later, uh, Children's Aid Society. They used to be mm -hmm. separate. It was the only place in, in BC where there was any separate mm -hmm. agency. But uh, I don't think I remember any mm -hmm. of the others. I left there. Um, uh, I was getting $140 a month, and uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs advertised uh, a post in what was then the Veterans Hospital here. I didn't get it, but I got a job in Winnipeg at 175 a month. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was there from 48 until 51. In Winnipeg? In Winnipeg with mm -hmm. the Department of Veterans Affairs. And what were you doing with that? Well, uh, there were social workers in the hospital there, and then there were what were called district social workers. We were responsible for all of Manitoba and that part of Ontario at the head of the lakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found it very hard picking up on fair. I know mostly what people do and how they are in their living, but it was different in Manitoba. Uh, it was very interesting. The welfare officers, who were untrained people, uh, and mostly had been officers in the services, uh, we had over 30 acts we were responsible for. And uh, uh, they earned uh, about half as much a gain as we did, but we were supposed to instruct them in welfare policy. So this was, and, and this was a district, uh, district social service, we were called, of the Department of Veterans Affairs. So the federal person was, was supposed to... No, we were, we were all federal people. I was a federal civil servant. Yes. Yeah. And the other... The, the other welfare officers were uh, a category of the staff of Veterans Affairs. Oh, all right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, there were three, uh, three social workers there. Mm -hmm. So I was there three years, and then uh, my family wanted to uh, have education in, in B.C., so I, I was uh, lucky uh, to uh, get a job with Shaughnessy Hospital. Altogether, I was in the Federal Civil Service um, oh, near enough to 12 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other years were spent as the, the job description. Uh, the title of the job was a medical social worker in Shaughnessy Hospital. We had six social workers. It was a 1,200-bed veterans hospital mm -hmm. then. How was that job at Shaughnessy different from what you've been doing before? Well, uh, in, in Winnipeg, uh, a file, there are three files for every veteran. One is in any place in Canada he ever was. One is in Ottawa. And uh, uh, one follows him <laughs> around. <laughs> but anyway, I was accustomed to meeting, reading medical records in files. The kind of thing you dealt with in in uh, in Winnipeg was um, family problems. People would come in about anything, you see, and the social workers commonly would get family problems and referrals. Uh, might be to Children's Aid Society or Family Service Agency or City Social Service, uh, calling on various kinds. I I, I sat on uh, applications for grants and loans. There was really a great a great variety of. Uh, of work. Uh, people who came in weeping might be referred to <laughs> social workers. People did. It was very interesting to me because uh, of the different social milieu. Um, uh, I came to terms with it very shortly, but it unsettled me at first. The villages there, uh, this was before health insurance, uh, uh, would decide whether they would pay for um, surgery in a hospital or whether the family would be charged a village corporation or whatever mm -hmm. the proper term was. And a Ukrainian farmer would come in and try to get a grant. Uh, if, if the village council didn't like old Joe because he let South Thistle get into the oats or something or other, you see, they would, and uh, uh, he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't want to um, uh, put his wife in the hospital because they would put a lien on his property. And I would seem to my crude imagination that his wife's life might be worth more. But then I came to realize that in the peasant economy, and very soundly, they would say, I've got a clear title. This is the life of the family. You know, it was very, very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, a little play 
place uh, commonly known as uh, Saint Laurent. I used to wonder what Saint Laurent was the prime minister. What would happen if, <laughs> if Saint Laurent went to Saint Laurent? You know? <laughs> but they had a village letter writer, and it was lovely. If anybody got a bottle of medicine, the letters would come and say in handwriting. Uh, House fall down in corner, my wife sick, baby she cry. Uh, my wife he very sick, uh, uh, need some medicine. You know, uh, uh -huh. I, I never got up to Saint Laurent, but uh, you would get letters from little uh, little orphanages uh, with Catholic sisters. Uh, they would have some be getting a, uh, educating an orphan child of a deceased veteran. You see uh -huh. things like this, uh, a great variety of things. Uh -huh. But it was it was a different world too. Mm -hmm. to get into. Claire, I want to diverge for just a moment. Um, um, were, were you in Winnipeg during the flood? Yes. Mm -hmm. In your work as a social worker? Did that uh, well, I remember uh, uh, people came into DVA uh, and the water was just a block down the street, some vagary from our offices, but we would get phone calls about some boat because they were accustomed to turning to DVA for help. But a social worker I knew, one of the greatest compliments I ever heard, another one I heard in Kitmat. But uh, there were various volunteers in the stations uh, evacuating refugees, and the station masters phoned some social work agencies and said, for God's sake, send us some social workers to handle these people. The volunteers can't cope with it. Uh -huh. The other story like that was in uh, Kitmat when it was first set up, the Aluminum Company of Canada, you know, great controversy there at the moment. But they had many uh, groups of immigrant laborers and they brought some uh, European uh, feelings with them and uh, the soccer games began to be lethal and there were a lot of problems in the raw community and the uh, the uh, Aluminum Company of Canada also said then to the BC government, we need some social workers here. Those are two times I remember when <laughs> unlikely groups thought the social workers <coughs> really were useful. Yeah. I wonder if they wanted you to referee in the soccer games or something. <laughs> no, no, they wanted to handle family problems, but maybe the, yeah. maybe the soccer games yeah. aggravated them too. Uh, to go back then to, to Shaughnessy, uh, what kind of work were you doing? There? Well, uh, there were six, uh, the kind of work that any social worker would do in any hospital. Uh, I was assigned two particular wards, uh, and uh, uh, one thing that interested me uh, very much, uh, I, it was another compliment to social workers. There was one social worker who worked full-time on the psychiatric ward, uh, but uh, uh, usually we, we had a lot of people come to outpatients because of the uh, the uh, heavy uh, population, loggers, fishermen, that kind of people who turn up in Vancouver, sometimes get drunk, or, you know, get to outpatients one way or another. And uh, sometimes they needed uh, psychiatric service. And the psychiatrist finally said, after the intern has said this person needs a psychiatric appointment, we want the social worker to see them. Uh, and the social worker will say how urgent the need is for an appointment. I remember once, I guess I was lucky, uh, saying that, uh, in effect, you're very careful not to diagnose, not being, your com not being your confidence, but I thought this man was suicidal and should see the psychiatrist right away. He did see him and sent him away and he jumped off the bridge and lost his life that night. It might have been the other way. You know? mm -hmm. But uh, you got very fond of some of the Skid Road people. They knew you, they'd come to you for the car ticket. Some cool thing. And some of the confused people that are contained in rooming houses, you're really, you, you, you know, quite uh, sick. I, I don't mind the boys up in heaven, but those fellows that sit up on the wires, you know, they're always being poisoned through the radiators or something or other. You, you, uh, and some of the alcoholics, a brilliant architect, you know, who revolves now and again. I used to write quite a lot of things. I put some of them over there for uh, Canadian welfare when I, before I. Uh, before I went to uh, CWC, Marjorie King, who used to edit what we then call Canadian Welfare, the magazine, quite a lot of things, mm -hmm. trying to, I call them vignettes, they weren't short stories, they weren't articles, a couple of times I wrote serious articles, but uh, trying to get people to understand what social workers do in the hospital, mm -hmm. you know, 
uh, helping with uh, helping with dying, uh, family problems, an old man worrying about an old wife. Uh, one I wrote about a man living alone with a farm, a dog, and a, a severely retarded boy. You know who takes care of him? What happens? Uh, uh, social assistance, urgency. People lived in Vancouver. Uh, uh, the head of the uh, city agency was very, very tough then. You'd have to wait about three weeks for an appointment and you'd call on the Salvation Army, the Red Cross. If you lived in Burnaby, uh, Burnaby would uh, order an emergency order of groceries to go to the home immediately and uh, see them the next day and buy a handmade pair of logging boots if that would give them a job. Mm -hmm. you, you notice the difference between mm -hmm. city, uh, uh, city policy. We also had uh, seamen, uh, mounted policemen, uh, uh, cadets, uh, various miscellaneous kind of people mm -hmm. whom the government dealt with by contract, which was in. We had uh, 30 new interns every year, and believe me, a fellow from Toronto may be as strange as someone fresh out from Greece. Uh, 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 for God's sake, get this fellow to give up fishing. You say you know BC. Okay, I know BC <laughs> in my bones. Uh -huh. Old halibut fisherman, you know, old sweet. Doctor thinks that I don't know, Mrs. Van come the halibut season. <laughs> you try to explain the excitement of the halibut season, <laughs> or uh -huh. getting home to get the winter wood in for your wife. You know, my mother in Roslyn had 22 feet of snow on the main street her first winter there. Oh, 22 Lord. feet is a lot of snow mm -hmm. if you don't have your winter wood in. You know, yeah. uh, so yeah. the folkways of British Columbia, different parts of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. The caribou, you know, we're so different. We're so different. It's not like one province, like yeah. 17 problems. So educating the interns was always kind of fun. You know. uh, just, just to help them understand about British Columbia as well as... Well, uh, I mean, you have to... Uh, I had a pro At that time, I had... My daughter was in art school. My two sons were in college, pure science. One is curator of fishes in the National Museum now. I had a law student and a medical student with me. They were friends of my son and they had no place to go. And I said, if you boys will make your own lunches and change your own bed, there's no more bother to cook for two of you. But anyway, our, our dinner conversation was rather riotous, you see. And I was always afraid, you know, I would say to the medical student, don't be such a utter blithering fool, Terry, and I was always terrified that one day I would say this to one of the, one of the interns, <laughs> you see, but I managed to, but to get, I, I nearly said it one day, one fellow said, uh, uh, will you, a referral to the social worker, will you explain this and that to that man's wife? I gritted my teeth and contained myself and said, Doctor, You've had this man under your care for three weeks and don't know that he was sleeping in a boxcar before he came into the hospital. You see, it's not very good medicine, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. There was also a sort of... Oh, I speak very crudely. Uh, selling your services to particular staff, one ward. I, I used to work in the ward where they did uh, brain surgery. You see those physicians age before your eyes in two or three years, seven hour long operations, but they also got the, the quote skid road bums who fell downstairs, you spent six weeks putting them together and they went out and got drunk again and came back, which was very trying. <laughs> but yeah. the, the nurse there was a marvelous person, but her family had known how to manage in the depression and she couldn't see why other people couldn't know how to manage, you know, but gradually she got, if in the end, you could help their patients, and they felt they needed you, you know. Mm -hmm. But it was slow, mm -hmm. and staff come and go. Mm -hmm. Staff come um, and go. Did the uh, one of the other people that I talked to in another province worked in a, in a veterans hospital and uh, had great diff they had great difficulty in the social work area convincing the physicians who were running the place that social work had an important contribution to me. But when I was in Winnipeg, I knew very well two social workers in Deer Lodge Hospital, which was a veterans hospital, and in the early days, uh, they had had a, a tough time, but it was a going concern when I went to Shaughnessy, you see. There were six mm -hmm. staff, and uh, 
we had a social worker came out from uh, from England. I think she had a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it was the same cultural problem I had when I went to um, Winnipeg. I remember uh, to her, a bricklayer is a bricklayer. Well, in our still pioneer province, it's changing. But the useful man in a lot of this province is a guy who's worked in a mine, he's worked in a logging camp, he could be a fisherman, he knows how to mend machinery, <laughs> you know what I mean. Well, to her that was a, a restless person who'd never settled. You see what I mean? Sure. You know, sure. You, you, staff come from elsewhere, you, you have to... We had students too, and that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Students from UBC? Yeah, from UBC School of Social Work, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. How were you involved with them? Supervising, mm -hmm. yeah. Any kinds of experiences with them that were? Well, I uh, one who ended up uh, uh, running the prison up the Fraser Valley before I left to go to C CWC. Mm -hmm. He was um, he had always wanted me to go out there, and I went out to see that. He's now high in the corrections of the federal. Uh, in the meantime, while I was at Shaughnessy Hospital, I was involved in uh, many things in the community. Uh, uh, I cannot remember whether it was then or whether I was on the, when I was on School of Social Work faculty, but I uh, chaired a committee on ethics, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. A complaint of ethics, uh, and this was um, <coughs> an effort was made to form a union of the Family Service Agency. Derek Thompson, who now works in social work here. And uh, the uh, the board uh, of the Family Service Agency and their senior staff felt that the things that were were said about uh, their personnel policies were not ethical. You see, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most difficult things I, I ever I ever did. Uh, uh, we uh, so. Um, uh, BCASW, which we then had, uh, I was on the executive and I was asked to chair this ethics committee. Uh, I consider it rather lucky that I also had a membership in the American Association mm -hmm. and I got their documents on ethics and our documents on ethics. And I got all the trade union literature to do with the organization of unions, you know, the government literature and the trade union literature and so on, and we thought and thought and thought about it. Uh, this is uh, definitely not for the record, but I will say to you, and you will cut it out, uh, it didn't help that some of the people who were active in, in or, or, trying to organize a trade union there were not the most beloved social workers. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you know, mm -hmm. but that didn't affect uh, the legality of it or the mm -hmm. ethics of it. And uh, we found uh, uh, that uh, they had not breached ethics in organizing, in their efforts to organize a union. And uh, there was then an appeal to the federal group, and I had to go down to Ottawa, You'd go down to Montreal, and there was a meeting, one of those little hilltop Centers, and it was yeah. a regular meeting of the of the uh, executive of the Canadian Association of Social Workers, and uh, I told them, I gave them our line of argument and all that we had done, and they approved it without a dissenting voice. Mm -hmm. They found for the recommendation of the committee that ethics had not been breached. Was but this it was an, an interesting? Uh, it's uh, stupid of me not to remember. I maybe my. <laughs> physical state of mind or my age of not past 77, whether it was when I was at Shaughnessy or whether when I was at the School of Social Work, I simply mm -hmm. can't remember. Mm -hmm. but, um, so uh, it was kind of a high point, uh, you know, in decisions, how, how commonly it's known. You know, group memories are very feeble, aren't they? Things mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, abstracts of minutes, if anybody wanted to do it, would be a horrible chore to do. Yes. But it would, it would be quite valuable to have, I, not because I did it, but I think a breach of ethics because of organizing a trade union is quite a high point. Well, you know, that needs to be remembered. Yeah. Particularly for you, with your long-term interest in the CCF and, and the yeah. FTP. Yeah. 
how did you resolve your your personal and your political? I don't uh, with think your it, I don't concerns? think it came into it. I don't think I thought about that at the time, and I don't think uh, other people did. Maybe the people involved weren't particularly aware of it, or maybe they were. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But it didn't. It could have, but it didn't mm -hmm. seem to. Uh, it didn't seem to come into it. <coughs> Was there discussion, uh, to your recollection? Um, about whether or not social workers should organize at all? Or was it just the ethics of the procedure that was at issue? Well, the char uh, probably it was based in your, your starting assumption, but also I think that some of the rather, uh, I, I don't think it was coarse in the sense of swearing or anything like that, but some of the kinds of terms that are used by trade unionists about personnel practices rather annoyed some of the more genteel people on the board. You see what I mean? They didn't want to be called like that there, you know. And they were kind of standard words. Uh, another, another experience, uh, go back to that one if you want to, but uh, when I was at Shaughnessy Hospital, um, uh, I was very active in what we then call community chest and councils and they had a committee about um, uh, social assistance rates that thought they were inadequate. Uh, I might go back to a BCASW one in my own living room when we were such a small group when I was in Victoria with the Children's Aid. But a man who was a so called cabinet minister and is now just a private kind of dissident so called member of the legislature, Davis. He was then an economist with the BC Electric Railway, uh, or BC, Ele BC Electric, not Railway. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was linked to the Vancouver Community Chest and Councils as an advisor mm -hmm. on this economic matter of whether the rates of social assistance were adequate or not. We studied for about a year, God save the poor, you know. And um, uh, at the end, we came out that they needed at least half as much again for a minimum adequate standard of living. Mm -hmm. And Davis said we should tone that down or, or they'd never buy it. And I said, in effect, I don't remember what pleasant words I used, you'll tone it down over my dead body. Those are the facts we found, and those are the facts we are obliged to report. And if we think they'll give us less, probably they will. But we have to speak to the facts. That was what the committee was for, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, we got a little bit of a relief, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was writing to uh, Wamsley just a couple of weeks ago about the current social system situation being cut down because the committee, I remember in my living room just before I was in the local executive just before I went to uh, work in Winnipeg. Uh, we were worried about social assistance rates, uh, the social workers, and uh, the province had someone like a dietitian or a home economist or something of that ilk then. I'm surprised that they did. But we asked them what would be a minimum adequate diet for a family of four, say two parents and two kids. Mm -hmm. And it was larger than the whole rate of social assistance, which have to pay the rent, buy the wood, uh, any postage stamps or toothpaste or shoes or anything else, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one time I knew, but I don't remember now, there was one state in the United States, maybe in Oregon, somewhere up and down the Pacific Coast, which every year, and I believe they do it in Montreal, don't they? Some of the figures used across Canada, minimum adequate diets and so on. Yeah. But every year in this American state, uh, they had a process which set up a minimum adequate amount of money that was needed for a family. Every year it was brought up by law and the, the legislature then allocated 100% or 90% or 75%, but I think that's a marvelous idea. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it would bring it before the conscience of the community every year. Yeah. And what I was saying to Wamsley, I think, uh, we need to have colloquy with some of the people about diets at the moment, mm -hmm. because the children have got their teeth and bones to me. Yeah, and they're getting into the same, the same kind of... Oh, the same kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, we've done away with the rental money. The rents are rising. Yeah. I've seen uh, 
drive yourself moving vans every day around here recently. I don't, they used to be able to go out into Saanich and shacks, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. no. um, Claire, when did you go, to this, uh, go back to get your master's degree? Well, I did it. I took a, a course when I was in, uh, in uh, Winnipeg, and then I did it piecemeal. And it's never as good, because you get so much from your colleagues. But while I was at Shaughnessy, and I did a double, uh, sort of double program. Uh, I think they were being nice to me. Leonard March, uh, March supervised my uh, thesis. I, I had a, a double, uh, um, double credit for it. Uh, yeah. It was on. Um, it, it, it ties right into the uh, the current scene in BC. Actually, it was uh, decisions, uh, class six care in the Department of Veterans Affairs and all our multifarious. It was what we would call long term care. Mm -hmm. You know, in BC we've got three levels of long term care, mm -hmm. and, uh, and decisions uh, regarding who needed it. Which the so you asked me what I did in the hospital. The social workers were always involved in that. And very interesting because sometimes a person that might require an incredible amount of care could be tolerated in the family. I remember having a finding whether this man could go home or whether we'd have to take care of him. And they already had an old grandma in the house and three teenage kids. And I said, oh, sure, this was only an uncle. Uh, sure, oh, sure, we'll take uncle back. And I thought, well, this is a family that values the old more than the teenage kids. I found there was social agency in themselves. They had all the teenage kids in the neighborhood coming in because old people were so <laughs> interesting. You know. And you'd have somebody else who would require very little care with a daughter and a wife. And, yeah. and no, no, there's no way in the world they could take yeah. care of father. Yeah. Yeah. So the social end of that decision was uh, a W E I G H waiting factor. You know. yeah. Yeah. So you did your master's a, a bit at a time. I had a bit of time, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I did some, I think I had one summer school, some leave, but it, it was, uh, uh, Marjorie King was the director of the school at that, uh, uh -huh. at that time. Uh -huh. um, any mem memorable colleagues or fellow students that... Uh, well, uh, uh, someone is still in, uh, in touch with, I spoke of this uh, Gertrude Williams who, uh, who, uh, uh, whom I met on the train, and I said, "What am I doing?" And Gertrude's doing. She's here in Victoria. She worked. For, she ended up. Uh, I don't know. If she was the top person using a crude term in in relation to adoptions under the then superintendent of child welfare. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, uh, one uh, we used to get a lot of students out from uh, the Prairie Provinces. Ina Rogers and I met in the old uh, diploma course, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I uh, kept in touch with her when I was on the prairie, and when she was on the prairie, I visited her doing social work in Yorkton, which was interesting to me. In a small town, it's very different than in a city. Mm -hmm. Your decisions about adoption or neglect or anything, you're meeting these people socially the next day, yeah. or at a picnic with them or something. Uh, I was very much struck by it, uh, compared with the anonymity of even a small place like Victoria, yeah. you know, oh. uh, but uh, she's in Vancouver now. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, um, to to close off this section, uh, I'd like to ask you a more general question, if I may. Um, um, one of the things that that always strikes me about this practice of social work is the expectations that people have of us as members of a profession. I was talking to someone last night about uh, an incident where um, some social workers had been at a party or something and got a call on, to go on a case. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering if the fact of your uh, single life had any impact on the perception of you as a professional social worker. Were those kinds of expectations? Well, uh, I think they vary. They're a certain section of the the poor and downtrodden of the community, and I, I think of the Lower Johnson Street rooming houses where a total community with a certain set of values existed and they cared about kids and they would protect kids if the parents were off on a bender or anything. Uh, and uh, 
they sometimes saw social workers as child snatchers. And then in the well-to-do community, there is the stereotype of the, of, uh, the do-gooders who want more and more money for the poor and don't snatch certain children who, who need to be snatched. I've got very interested in it. If you look down the street, you'd see a community center of a community school. I'm on the executive of the Community School Society, and I was, I'm, I'm trying to make this brief, on the board of our wonderful James Bay Health and Human Resources Project, which you need to know a lot about. And uh, uh, teachers often see children as neglected and in need of immediate protection and uh, social workers cannot snatch them away, and it's very slow to effect change in the parents. Uh, BCASW here had one of the best symposiums I was ever at, uh, an all-day thing once, getting teachers and social workers together. And the first thing they did was put up on the blackboards the stereotype of the other profession. My, <laughs> well, but the, 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 there's that kind of, uh, uh, ask me your question again. I'm getting away from. No, I, um, as as uh, uh, as a single parent myself, and uh, uh, you having gone through that experience as well, wondering whether 40 years ago the expectations of the community were troublesome. I don't uh, think I ever ran into that. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it may have existed, but it didn't. Uh, make me uh, aware of it uh, particularly. Never any uh, particular criticism. Mm -hmm. You had to watch your own children. Oh, indeed. Mm -hmm. I imagine. W would that be something like uh, minister's kids? Well, I, I didn't think in that way. I mean, if you had an emergency call <laughs> because children were alone, <laughs> mine were not that small, but still my my daughter was about eight, I guess, at that time. Yeah. So you'd have to worry about well, yeah. up somebody else's kids and leaving yeah, your own. Once there, I had a woman who used to come in by the day, a story I like very much. My children were fortunate. I've never had the delightful experience myself to watch uh, a cat hatching her kittens, but I, I had a very Scotch woman who used to come in and get lunch and do this and that. And I came in one day and when I was on my children's aid round, I would dash in and said to her, um, how do you like the kittens, Mrs. Blinkety Blank? Uh, Mistress McAllister, I don't know why you would keep a female cat. <laughs> so I went away soon. <laughs> she had a few pet of the upbringing of children. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Maybe that'd be a good place to stop. Okay. Okay. Right? okay. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't make you any coffee. Oh, no, I must tell you the reason. Uh, uh, I am. Um, not on my usual grocery rounds. I grind my own coffee, and I bought a pound the other day, of, not in the usual place, pound of beans. I've heard about bitter coffee, but this is practically like vinegar. <laughs> oh. I would hate to get I should throw them oh, out. Oh, well. I haven't been able to get any more. <laughs> <laughs> I can stir you up a cup of Nescafe. <laughs> Well, if you fancy. No, that no. would be all right. I just mm. want to stand up for a moment. Well, myself. come over here and look at the mountains from this window, and I will make my little jar. Those are very nice. You know, I like them for uh, uh, if you're having just a bit of salad or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Put some cheese on one for your fellow workers. Yeah, he, he got one. He got one, didn't Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. I'm about to write another letter to the uh, to the paper. They have, a, we're paying for these ads in New York or heaven. The uh, agency in Victoria from 140 got 175. I forget what I uh, got when I left Shaughnessy or what I got when I went to the Canadian yeah. Welfare Council. Exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. but anyway, uh, there was a, a, an advertisement for someone in the Family and Child Welfare Division and I did apply for it, and I did get the, uh, I did get the uh, job. My family were on their, uh, were on their own at that point, and uh, so I went to, uh, I went to Ottawa. I was um, rather embarrassed when I got there because a write-up appeared in Canadian Welfare saying that I had been for years with uh, 
family agencies and so on. Presumably whoever wrote it up hadn't read my ad because I had been, had been briefly with the Children's Aid Society mm -hmm. <laughs> and years with Veterans Affairs yes. and in the hospital. But actually hospital social work gets you very much into uh, you know, family yeah, and, right. and child uh, welfare. But uh, uh, still the, the Eastern scene is it, all of our um, family and child welfare work in, in this province uh, was uh, under the uh, provincial arm by then, mm -hmm. and of course in 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 Manitoba there were still children's aid societies when I was there, and I often made referrals to them. But still, the Ontario scene with the many little local children's aid societies, not but what's the whole of Canada with with the scene, but it 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 was uh, different and interesting to me. I remember going to a, a conference of. Children's Aid Societies in Toronto, and uh, the Royal York Hotel was on strike, and there were pickets. We always stayed in the Simcoe. The staff had a special deal a couple of blocks away, so I talked with the pickets, and I figured they were the clients of the Children's Aid Society, many of them were kitchen help and chambermaids and so on, and said I was sorry to cross the picket line, but I wasn't staying in the hotel. I talked with them a bit. And talking with the people attending the Children's Aid Society meeting. It seemed not to have occurred to any of them that the matter of the picket line and striking staff in the road was of any interest or concern at all to, mm -hmm. to them. I remember one issue which came up before that conference, which was uh, the possibility of uh, uh, subsidizing adoptions to some extent uh, very good parents who really could not afford to maintain another child, but who would be good parents, and whether something could come from the provincial uh, purse to assist uh, people. And another question was whether a fee could be charged for processing an adoption. And I was rather startled by an older social worker with tears in her voice saying, you're going to take away from me that wonderful feeling I get when I place a child in parents' arms. <laughs> I thought, oh dear me, <laughs> is this why we're in social work? But I'm sure adoption has its rewards like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine. But I, I remember only those issues. I remember I, I staffed a national committee on homemaker services and uh, found it very interesting how different they were in different parts of the country. Uh, one in Halifax, uh, this may not be strictly accurate, but it's somewhere in the Maritimes, I think it was Halifax, had been set up really uh, to be active in the homes of mothers who were hatching another child, you know, originally. In other places, they mainly served old people, you know, particular uh, variant uses. Some of them had a multiplicity of uses. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew one person who had uh, worked uh, with the Toronto Homemaker Service and finally left it because she used to do intake and she said she had to turn down so many requests that in the end it, it got down to her. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it just mm -hmm. was too much to uh, uh, take. I, I made a tour of the Maritimes when I was there. Um, I thought of it the other day. Uh, these blizzards they've been having, you know, it was in Cabreton and people were coming from New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. One of those March blizzards, the night I arrived, and uh, people were stranded all over the Maritimes. They went on those two-day conferences, you know, oh. all, all over the all over the Maritimes. <laughs> but still, we had the conference, and the anyway. next day the March blizzard thawed away. You know? anyway, yeah, and then I visited in in New Brunswick uh, and. Uh, down in mainland Nova Scotia as well. As I lived three years in Cabret and I was interested in the conference there, of course. Mm -hmm. When you went to work for uh, Canadian Welfare Council, that must have been around 1960, was it? I was there between 60 and 62, yes. I was mm -hmm. there two years. What was the role of the council then? Well, it had divisions. And uh, you had the Family and Child Welfare Division. You had Corrections, which was a separate organization, actually. Uh, self-governing but uh, considered to be affiliated with the council so it wasn't properly a division of the uh, of the council the um, the uh, French speaking services were uh, separate you know mm -hmm. uh, then uh, George Huffam was in research 
when I was there. George Chapman was just retired as uh, uh, director of the school, of, UBC School of Social mm -hmm. Work. I, at one time, was uh, assisting in the preparation of a brief. They put me to do some interviewing. It was a brief to the Senate, actually, which had a committee on uh, employment problems, and the employment problems were considered to be women, old people, handicapped people, and uh, very young people, you know. And uh, they sent me up to a um, uh, someone in one of the high-rise towers, I forget, one of the national firms, let's say, one of the big oil companies or something, and then uh, talking Steelworkers Union in Hamilton and so on. And he was interested in, in, uh, in uh, mixed employment and uh, I remember he said, he usually told the boys, well, hell, you want to go and sell ribbons? <laughs> it was a very interesting experience, some of this interviewing. I remember going with George to, um, to uh, be involved in the presentation of the brief to the, to the Senate, mm -hmm. one of the jobs that I... One did a, a lot of um, consultation and answering correspondence. I remember the boys from Northern Affairs came and took our opinions. And, they were revamping <coughs> the, uh, some of the social legislation in Northern Affairs areas where there was less self-government than there is now. And they were particularly interested in some of the Inuit customs about adoption. And they wanted to get, they just wanted to think out loud with us really. We, they had more knowledge than we did. But uh, there was some obligation if there was a childless couple for someone else to give them a child if you had a lot. People had a right to have a child. Mm -hmm. I was very interested in this kind of uh, um, sensitivity. Mm -hmm. uh, you sometimes said, I remember that one particularly. You, you, I was very interested. You'd often get letters about some elderly single person, widow or never married, or old man, and for some reason alone, and they had no relatives. And they wanted to give their money to some orphanage. And uh, the idea of orphans in need, uh, I did a, a long article for Canadian Welfare about the immigrant children. There have been books about it since, you know, the Barnardo kids that mm -hmm. came out. I, I had been reading in the library and I ran into the early institution of um, child welfare services in Ontario, really was because of concern, because of those immigrant children. Mm -hmm. But I thought their publicity must have been marvelous because here were still these old people going back to this age when orphanages were necessary, you know, sure. and services to him. And sure. they wanted to know to what orphanage should they leave. And I thought our publicity wasn't as good nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, a, a couple of things about uh, child welfare generally in, in, in that time period. One uh, is the issue of uh, uh, adopting kids out of the province or out of the country. Was that something that you wanted? Uh, it happened rather after I was there. Well, it was happening when I was there. Marion Murphy, who uh, died a few years ago, took her own life, actually. She had become psychotic. And she, she had worked in the Children's Aid Society uh, in Ottawa after she left Canadian Welfare Council. She was a depressed person. I'd, I'd known her in BC, but um, uh, she was working on it. You see, I was only briefly with the council two years because of going to the School of Social Work and having this addiction to my own province. But uh, I remember once reading, uh, <coughs> meeting Marion coming off a plane with children which she had brought out. But uh, we had had some correspondence with the Americans in our division about cross-border crossings. And I was going down to a conference on child welfare in Washington, D.C., and I was in touch with uh, a woman, I can't remember now what the F American Federal Agency would be, but anyway, she, she was uh, concerned, and so were we with cross-border adoptions. Mm -hmm. And I had a meeting with her while I was uh, there. I remember her being very kind to me and driving me around to see some of the evening sights and uh, so on. And uh, uh, there was concern about it at that time, but I wasn't with them long enough to follow through. Mm -hmm. It's still a contentious issue, of course, right at the moment about uh, 
Indian children. They don't mm -hmm. want to be called natives after all. We're natives, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And uh, being accustomed to say natives for yeah. years, I, I find it hard to remember. But uh, certainly the, uh, the agency was concerned with it at that time. Um, the other issue that, that I wanted to ask about, which I understand was also uh, perhaps a hot one at the time, was the idea of commercial or for-profit uh, maternity homes. I don't remember that coming under our purview at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, who were some of your other colleagues uh, during the time that you were with the Canadian well, uh, Council? Uh, I've, I've mentioned uh, Marion. Uh, uh, Marie, uh, I'm wondering if she has, uh, uh, she has just died. Uh, I haven't heard from her this Christmas, and I didn't get around to calling when I was in Ottawa. Marie uh, Amel? Yes. Uh, uh, she married late in life, a very happy marriage. Uh, and I've been their guest several times in, 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 in Ottawa. But uh, she, she was uh, running the French publication, mm -hmm. which was then separate. I'm so glad now. There's this is, um, new magazine buried there, a new um, Canadian magazine, which has articles in one language or the other in Tracy's op very Options, it's called. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, awfully good. And I'm glad uh, uh, the uh, new organization's new title of publication is on that, on that, uh, on that principle. Uh, Réal Rouleau uh, mm -hmm. was there. Uh, I mentioned Bill Dyson. Mm -hmm. And who was the director at that time? Dick Davis. Any recollections about working with uh, Mr. Davis? I uh, well, never seemed to see very much of, uh, of uh, Dick Greeley. Mm -hmm. uh, there, uh, <coughs> there would be meetings of... I remember when I was early there, uh, uh, Marion Murphy had handled the um, the um, committee on homemaker service, and she took me to uh, uh, Toronto to meet what was then the retiring uh, chairman of the National Committee on Homemaker Service. She was the widow of a well-known Anglican bishop, one of the wonderful old homes, you know. And there I was, a rather a stranger to the national scene, having to find. <laughs> A new chairman for the committee, and you know when you don't know the Eastern establishment, you come from the wilds of British Columbia, and are, are not accustomed to this national scene. I find, finally turned up a woman in Montreal who had been a member of the committee, who, who was. Uh, I, I used to see a good deal of. Oh dear, uh, who was the, um, the. Uh, Women's Bureau, the early head of the Women's Bureau, hmm. in a, a federal civil servant, you know. Mm -hmm. I remember when she took on an assistant, she to say, various conferences. She seemed to take quite an interest mm -hmm. in our affairs. Oh dear. Okay, um, you you were at the council for two years, a couple of years. Yeah. What inspired you to leave, and where did you go? Being a British Columbian <laughs> inspired me. Well, seeing a vacancy advertised on the faculty of the School of Social Work, and uh, I, I thought I'd like to be back in my own province. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was it. Uh, also, when I'd had uh, Social Work students, uh, when I was in the, uh, in the hospital, uh, I didn't happen to have one when I was uh, the three years in Winnipeg, but uh, the three member staff, the, the head of the staff that had a social work student had a good deal to do with it. And I thought that would be that would be a nice thing to to do. Mm -hmm. So um, <coughs> that my first job was um, uh, a field work uh, supervisor. And uh, then later <coughs> I became the admissions load became so heavy uh, uh, get 1,500 inquiries, not all very serious, but they all had to be dealt with to admit 75 students, you know. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of um, agencies who have students who are superb, and to pick and choose is very, like the, like the woman who left the homemaker agency because she had to turn down so many. But yeah. it, uh, 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 I, I did a lot of interviewing. It got very interesting 
if any uh, psychologist uh, that used to amuse us when I was in Chelsea Hospital, they used to test veterans for what uh, kind of work they would be suitable to have university training, you know. Mm -hmm. You'd see these reports in the files. And if they were clearly very definite odd bobs, quite peculiar types, they all thought they were suitable to be social workers. <laughs> so, you know, if I had a stereotype, <laughs> we used to interview the applicants, you see, of social workers. But uh, my fellow workers, I found it rather amusing. They decided they didn't, they just wanted to rate people pass or fail. They didn't want the heartbreak of giving them marks. On the other hand, they wanted uh, uh, only people to be admitted who had superb marks, you see. So I used to argue with my colleagues, you really can't have it <laughs> both ways. <laughs> you don't want a mark, but you want, they wanted the top grade. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a, an extraordinarily interesting area. What is uh, suitable, very hard to defend when you've had a variety of experience. Uh, they would all say, uh, I love people. Mm -hmm. And I, I schooled myself not to say, well, I assume dogs like dogs. Ducks, you know, but I mean, but you know that uh, mm -hmm. uh, I really care about uh, people. But uh, prospecting in their stereotypes of the social worker's role. One of the articles I never did write was about that. Mm -hmm. What they conceived the activity of a social worker to be, and then how many roles there are within it. Uh, community work nowadays, group work. And case work using the old mm -hmm. terms, research, you know, all kinds of. Somewhere they got some kind of a stereotype, which mm -hmm. wasn't the whole. What kind of criteria of, did you use? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, there, there again, it's, it's very hard to. It's very hard to say. You continue to think about it and inspect it and document it and write it down and discuss it with the committee. And uh, there you are. I think one of the things I found very interesting, uh, at one time the school, even I went to Alberta to interview a whole lot of people, is to bet what kind of a person can bear being a social worker alone in a distant rural community, mm -hmm. like based in Williams Lake and sort of the Coat or something. And some city people can do that. I never found out how to guess. But some people moved into it. You know, you know them when you know. Uh, you, uh, again, people who are in social work, who are many of the applicants for training, they've had in-service training in this province or some other province. Uh, but uh, I think it's a very critical area to mm -hmm. think about. A, a thing that I used to use was to ask them if they were working people or even if they weren't born somewhere in Vancouver. Tell me about the community you live in. Mm -hmm. And if they could see the different kinds of groups, how people earned their living, what kind of immigrant groups had come in there, the kind of thing you used to hear about in the days of one-room schools when I was an undergraduate in the 20s and your friends went out and taught in one-room. They'd tell you all about If you had that sensitivity to what, you know, what made a community live and breathe? Who were the powerful groups, the powerless groups, and so on? I used to work on this when I had students in fieldwork first in Westminster. Mm -hmm. Help them to see the community. Mm -hmm. Old indentured Chinese labor still living on the riverbanks, fishermen. What kind of unions are here? Who are the well-to-do group? Mm -hmm. How do they intermix? Read the newspaper every day and talk about it. Look at the ads. You know, uh, mm -hmm. but I think to see the total, this was the thing that I, I valued, mm -hmm. uh, that I began to use as a routine. Describe the community where you have worked. Tell me about it. And were the people that you were supervising, uh, moving away from admissions to supervision, w would they have been in uh, community practice or were those? Well, uh, some students? of them would be raw recruits. Some of them were from the uh, uh, prairie and new to British Columbia, the, the variety. I had eight the first year. Boy, that was a very, too many, too many. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it was it was interesting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. During the years that you were at the UBC School of Social Work, a period of what, 62 to 70, I guess it would have been, 71 mm -hmm. or so. Yeah. 
um, was a time at uh, student unrest, uh, the women's liberation movement, all kinds of things were at Vietnam, all kinds of things were happening in, in communities and in, in, the, in North America that had an impact on student life in most places. Did those things impact what was happening uh, with you? Uh, I'll tell you that I remember, I remember once while I was there, uh, some American student activists turned up and uh, any place here where you can't go, so a whole horde of students went through the faculty club and they weren't particularly interested, but it seemed to be that they didn't do any damage or anything, but it was rather <laughs> fun, I they thought. Mark, Mark but it was an idea of the, of the the, you know, some of these people come up and work with the immigrants, too, with the Indians too, and uh, they're not particularly pertinent to to our issues. Uh, a day that I do remember there is the day the uh, the Americans and and Cuba, and it was a beautiful noonar day, and. Uh, Walking around at noon, we were waiting for the news, and all the young men were idling, sitting in the sunshine, looking handsome and beautiful and desirable, and all the girls were looking at them and thinking, are these fellows going off to war? It was an extraordinary, you, you felt this in every face and bone she looked at. It was an extraordinary thing. Was the day the Cuban the Cuban yeah, Missile Crisis came yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. And were the Americans going to go in there and go slam bang? Mm -hmm. And would we be involved? You know, it, 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 the most pervasive feeling tone I think that I ever uh, saw on the on the campus. Mm -hmm. uh, How did student activism during those years show itself at the faculty of social work, or did it? I don't know that it did uh, particularly. I don't remember any particular issues. We moved. Uh, it was rather interesting physically. Uh, we had lived in a made-over barn, which always had a faint odor, and then we moved into the millionaire mansion. <laughs> you know, the rags riches. That was uh, that was uh, that was uh, quite something. Yes, but I don't remember any uh, particular. Uh, I used to copy down things in Chelsea Hospital. Funny things the interns wrote on the files at midnight uttering vague disgruntlements. I don't <laughs> remember the students raising any particular uh, particular issues. The agencies were always raising issues, of course, about some of their dear employees who couldn't get into the school, or particular people who were turned down the registrar's policy about uh, the kind of marks uh, making you admissible to graduate studies, though we had more self-control than some people. but. Uh, very difficult sometimes. Uh, people who were widely esteemed and who felt would have done well to have to, or inappropriate, um, inappropriate uh, preparation, uh, school counselors giving totally wrong information about what was needed and, um, you know, sociology, psychology, some of the kind of things you want. And, Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of preparation. Sometimes these things were issues, or mm -hmm. some. Uh, we had one awfully good thing there that I think has been done away with now. Uh, it was then a graduate school. Now it's different, of course. But um, uh, in the post, in the second postgraduate year, we had students on an individual tutorial, uh, on the English scheme, and it was a three-unit course. And I found this was superb for filling in uh, gaps in a student's life experience or uh, helping them with their sense of direction, the kind of work they wanted to go into. And they would write a paper, which you never saw. They read it to you, and then you discussed it. Mm -hmm. And you would agree on the topic for the next one. I found that was a marvelous scheme. I enjoyed mm -hmm. it very much. Mm -hmm. I remember um, having a fisherman's wife, and she did me a paper on the the sociology. She was going to go and be working up the Fraser Valley, among fishermen's wives up near Mission. Mm -hmm. Sociology, you know, a fisherman, no matter when he comes home or if his wife had just broken her leg or the baby had died or something, he expects his wife to be at home. <laughs> like the Navy, you know. Like what? Like the Navy, oh. you know, mm -hmm. or train men. <laughs> yeah. This, 
many of these kind of things are mm -hmm. very interesting. But uh, I think it was useful to the students too as a, as a scheme. I think most of them enjoyed it. I had the one girl who had had a French father, and she had lived a year in France. And I, I used to get some books in French from Laval. Hardly any of the they do some awfully good studies, you know, mm -hmm. on the, uh, the state of the family and this kind of thing. She was able to read some of these, and we were able to discuss them. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, over over the years, Claire, you, were you much involved with the professional association? Uh, I was on the executive when I left Victoria to go to Winnipeg, <coughs> and I was on the executive when I was at the school of social work uh, in Vancouver mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I uh, I retain a retired membership but I hardly ever get to meetings here except uh, during our recent provincial crisis uh, going on the picket lines and uh, uh, we were we were, were preparing a, a symposium about uh, some of the issues in the strike but people were so worn out with picketing the night we were planning the symposium. Nobody came except the symposium people. It was very, it was very entertaining. So we all, we all we were very glad to go home. <laughs> but once in a while I go to an institute or something or other. But I am very busy in things in the, in the community which uh, involve you with social work issues. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Was the has the professional association been uh, uh, a way or, or a means uh, through which um, improvements could come about in British Columbia? Well, I, I think so. Uh, uh, Glenn Hamilton was a particular crusader for, uh, we used to be very proud of uh, BCASW and CASW being professional associations. It was very hard for some people to make the bridge. Um, in-service uh, training and gradual steps uh, toward more knowledgeable social workers with uh, various kinds of institutes and seminars and so on, being entitled to be regist uh, registered social workers. And I'm sure this has been a step, a, a step ahead because it has enabled more people to advance toward more training and maybe at some point uh, uh, some of them will uh, other provinces um, used to be more generous in sponsoring students. Uh, ABC School of Social Work used to get a lot from uh, um, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, uh, more Saskatchewan, I think, than Manitoba, and mm -hmm. Alberta, who, who came. Uh, there are schools of social work elsewhere. But I think the association taking that very major step has meant an advance in social work, a larger membership, and so on. Mm -hmm. What about? <coughs> The, you've been so involved in politics, uh, formal party politics, over the years. What do you see as the relationship between party politics and, and the profession? Well, uh, <coughs> I don't know that there's been any formal relationship, except I think that a great many social workers would perceive the NDP as being, and I speak with a certain bias, which I try to expect, social issues. I went once with a delegation of social workers, and that was one of the funniest things I ever did. <coughs> uh, we had to get the, the, the ministers uh, commonly to make it difficult for delegation, give you maybe a 9.30 a.m. appointment, so you have to get a ferry from Vancouver at 6 a.m. or something other, you know, to get here. And the Minister of <coughs> Welfare was in the Social Credit Minister of Welfare, who was uh, particularly notorious. Um, now, uh, Bridget Moran, a social worker up in Prince George, a provincial social worker, had burst into print uh, uh, and uh, public protest about some things that were happening in, uh, <coughs> it wasn't called human resources then, it was called welfare. And uh, he assumed that we had come in league with her. He took out a figurative black snake whip. He was <laughs> notorious, you know. <laughs> and roared and bellowed at us. Galliardi? Galliardi, yes. And it was so funny because we were pure and innocent as the driven snow. We had not, there were no newspapers on the ferry. We didn't know nothing about Bridget Moran. And finally we managed to, to, to 
to convince him of this, and it was so funny because he was deflated, you know. It was awfully funny. <clears throat> and we were asking for uh, more staffing, and then we went around, uh, as is customary with delegations, to see other parties. And I remember uh, the old, uh, the old Bull of the Woods, uh, the Liberal Party. Uh, he, uh, I'm losing names at my age, as you see. I use age as an excuse for it. Uh, we're talking about the sharpness of staff and how difficult it was and so on. And I mentioned the Chilcotin as having great distances. And he, he had a tender heart, you know, Kurt Gibson. And uh, he said, uh, but take it, you know, I mean, uh, you know, if there was a family and they hadn't enough, wouldn't there be some good woman? And I could see her traipsing across the chill coat with her little basket in her hand. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Bountiful, Adam. Yeah, uh, but uh, the, uh, I think the, the custom of, of going to government persists, but of course, uh, uh, and particular issues, uh, sometimes in corrections, which is another area of, uh, of uh, social work staff concern, particularly in health, another area, as well as child protection and social assistance and family counseling and all of these other things. Uh, people have gone on particular issues, and I think this persists, but of course at the moment uh, we are uh, immensely concerned uh, through the uh, through the, uh, the recent strike and now the cutting down of staff as to what is happening in this province and the thing that concerns me <coughs> is how poor our publicity has been about what social workers really do and particularly about what social assistance really is I float here in this peninsula there are roughly 10,000 people and I don't know the most recent census figures, but between six and 7,000 of them are people over 65. Hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a New Horizons group here. I, I often go down for Friday lectures, and uh, um, I take the bus downtown. I never take my car downtown. It's a wonderful way to wait in the bus stop and talk to people and hear conversations to pick up the public mood. Many of these people are from the prairie and they knew harder times than we did in BC in the last depression. And they have a rooted conviction that uh, teachers are overpaid. They have a very strong feeling against teachers. Very mm -hmm. interesting. And uh, the other thing is that people don't need all this money they get on social assistance. And to really think of it in terms of budget, you know, older people probably have enough sheets, blankets, towels, and to last the rest of their life. Uh, people newly married don't have any. They mm -hmm. have kids. Uh, to see what it really means to be living. You know, you can't go down and cut the trees on the boulevard and, and build yourself a house. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what are the rents? What does food cost? The kind of shoes that kids wear nowadays, you don't re them three times, you've got to go and buy new ones or put cardboard mm -hmm. in the bottom. And I, I think there's an enormous educational task. Mm -hmm. What is happening to the clients? Right. Why is it so slow to get families under the torture of unemployment, raised rent, inadequate social assistance, uh, and you bang the kids? Why wouldn't you? Because you're having a headache anyway. Mm -hmm. And how slow it is to change them. It, 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 it's a job we are not doing well. Mm -hmm. I was out one day with an old friend and there were two guests and I we got on to shooting off about <coughs> need of housing. You can't be rude to your old friend's guest you never met before. But she said, um, Mrs. McAllister, I don't know what you mean. She lives in a beautiful home in Skyline on the water, but we're building lots of houses. What do you mean there isn't enough housing? Well, you know, how do you get over to her? If your rent is just raised, how are you going to save enough money for a five thousand dollar deposit to build a house you couldn't afford if you had the deposit? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. family housing. I don't think the NDP or social workers or anybody else is talking enough about the need of family. Mm -hmm. In the last depression, any bread man or milkman, you know, the least skilled, lowest paid person, he had a decent wife, we could have a house. Who can have mm -hmm. a house now? Mm -hmm. You know, professional people with jobs can hardly have a house. I, I think this is another issue that 
impact of housing on families mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. should take up. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested, uh, again, about the relationship between politics and the profession. Do you think that um, <coughs> social workers should, as, a, as professionals, should be more involved in politics? Is that the way things get better? I think it's one avenue that is open to us. I have to inspect my own uh, bias. Uh, people may feel that any party is the one that would be, be good, but I think uh, if we clarify uh, social issues, we may ask on particular issues a, a deputation to uh, uh, take up the matter for us. Uh, <coughs> Or we, we may go through other... I had an interesting experience. Uh, I was asked to act on a committee. We worked for two and a half years. I chaired it the last six months of its life, and then the government killed it, but I don't think it was because I was chairing it. But it was called the Educational Advisory Committee to the Adult Care Facilities Licensing Board, and it was appointed by the government as a volunteer job. And its job was to consider the education of people in multi-level care facilities, our awkward new name for three levels of care in what we used to call nursing homes. And uh, the government is getting, this is a long way to answer you, but I think it's absolute. Uh, the, the, the government is encouraging volunteer groups. I worked on one for three and a half years here at Beckley Farm Lodge, 75 beds. Volunteer groups to set up multi-level care facilities. Where are they going to get staff? Now, the NDP had down at the school there, uh, carousing around this province, a uh, uh, commission on uh, older women. Mm -hmm. And I was down there one evening. There was a snowstorm. Marg Mitchell, an old soldier from Vancouver, mm -hmm. MP, was there. Uh, but uh, a woman came to me. She worked in uh, a home for seniors. Uh, it used to be called the Home for Aged and Infirm Women. It's now called Rose Manor. It's near Rose and Joseph's Hospital. And uh, she said, I came here. I, I thought you'd be here. And she said, I'm not a nurse's aide. In fact, I don't have any training, and I work at Rose Manor. And they have me giving out the night medications, and I don't think I should be doing it. And I said to her, have you got the union there? She said, yeah, we got it recently. I said, well, that's good. I said, don't you? I said, not only you shouldn't be doing it, and you've got enough sense to know that, but it happens to be illegal. I said, you get the union to write to the Adult Care Facilities Licensing Board and say that this is happening, and uh, they will look into it. Now, this is an area of concern when I had social see, you've got to get to the government. You've got to know the avenues to the government. And I think social workers, when I had students in New Westminster, we were given a whole batch of annual reports of adult care facilities, nursing homes, mm -hmm. that were overdue for inspection. And this needs doing. Any person knows somebody in one of these facilities, and they know that things are bad. A woman spoke to me uh, recently in the hall here. She'd uh, taken sweaters and various things to someone in a nursing home. They all vanished. Seth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lovely new dressing gown, things like this. Uh, but I think social workers need at least to know the avenues through which to address government. And if they want to go beyond that, uh, this to me is one of the, uh, the gross areas we need the kind of people who can go to these places, not as inspectors, though the inspector needs to be done. What food are they actually getting? Do they ever see any fresh vegetables, fruit juice? How many staff are there at night if there's a fire? A place up the street here, a couple of people have got jumped out of windows and lost their lives. Uh, you know, but if knowing the avenues isn't good enough and things aren't happening, then I think your deputations to government, and personally, I think belonging to a party that is pushing for the kind of changes which the professional association believes to be desirable, but everybody isn't interested in politics, mm -hmm. you know. No. 
but I can see nothing unethical or improper about it. Mm -hmm. You know, civil servants have a rights nowadays they didn't used to have. Uh, they can get leave of absence and run for a political party. You know, there are certain things. That, uh, mm -hmm. um, Moving now to some, some more general questions uh, that will lead us toward a closing. Um, I'm wondering if you could share with us your recollections or your, your, your opinions, sorry, your opinions about the most significant developments that have affected social welfare in BC over the years. You mean desirable changes? Um, perhaps not even desirable. Yeah. What, ha what has made the biggest impact on how social welfare is developed in this province? I don't know. I got the quick, quick answer to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have too quick an answer to a great many things. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> well, I don't, uh, I don't know whether people have, uh, whether the citizen in general has a much better understanding even than in the 30s. There's some hostility to the poor. There must be something wrong with it. They wouldn't be poor. <laughs> I guess, you know. There are a greater variety of um, organizations to meet needs. So I remember being on the board of the John Howard Society here years ago, but there are greater varieties, but here we are, you know, back to soup kitchens and things again. A, a dear little Scotch woman came in to me last night her, from the Presbyterian Church to bring me some goodies because I'd been sick. And uh, they had for their noon meal in a charitable spirit the same soup that was being given out in the soup kitchen, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which is a good kind of gesture. But, uh, you know, we, here we go again single men, single young girls nowadays are being cut off social assistance is there, is there progress. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling a little dispirited. Mm -hmm. So many uh, what, what seem to be backward moves are taking place in many places across the country. For those of you who have been around for a while, uh, one wonders if, if the wheel is just uh, turning again. Well, I think, again, having started in child welfare, and I think I like child welfare as well as anything I ever did, it's a very interesting kind of bifurcation. In a way, you're the voice of the conscience of the community by, uh, by law. Certain standards of the care of children have to be met. You can't help parents to change unless you can truly say with absolute truth, I'm here because word has reached us that things are not good, that something must be hurting, why are you acting like that? I really want to know, I really want to understand, so that you have this kind of split personality and, and the skill to really feel with the neglecting parents, except in the utterly pathological cases where people are maybe psychotic. Um, you know, but the slowness of change with your greatest skill and with your greatest feeling is something that isn't understood and the kind of skills which enable people to move. I, I know a, an intelligent woman who, who teaches halfway between the in Princeton, halfway between the Okanagan and the coast, and apparently it's a kind of cap. The immigrant people from Quebec or the prairie or people who go to the <laughs> coast and hope to get jobs are going, they all stop in Princeton and they get kids in the schools. Whenever I see her, she's telling me truly horror stories about the inadequacy of the social services, what mm -hmm. is happening to some of these, mm -hmm. to some of these kids, you know. Yeah. And in our project across the, uh, the street here, this would enable me to talk about this. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it at all. There were three of these experiments, Houston, uh, Grand Isle, four of them, and the Charlottes, and this is the only urban one. This was instituted by the NDP government 
the James Bay Community Health and Human Resources Project. Staff has seconded to us. Uh, we are funded by the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Human Resources. And uh, we have two paid doctors and a nurse practitioner uh, who are hired by the board uh, and staff is seconded to us from Human Resources. And it's the kind of dream I have always had of having uh, the health people and the human resource people and the welfare people able to work together, not without the knowledge and permission of any client. Mm -hmm. But um, our board is elected every two years when the, uh, the, uh, the uh, city council and the aldermen are elected. And we have initiated many things. We had our own homemaker service before it was a general provincial service. Uh, we have initiated an extraordinary number of things, especially Farm Lodge, originated out of a committee which went to the project. We have community workers. We tie in with the community wing of the community school. We used to have a full-time probation officer in this area. We don't need him anymore. He comes over from the main part of Victoria when needed. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is a kind of thing I think that needs to be uh, put some things here to to show you, mm -hmm. known about and uh, talked about, because to me it's the ideal way. It's the right place to go. You're worried about your grandmother, your neighbor's child, your husband, anybody, uh, anything. You know, it's the right place to go. Mm -hmm. And that's so good. That's and for the doctors, it's like a small town. They know the apartments. They know who will be helpful to anybody. You know, they know all about it. They can get there on their feet or a bicycle the car mm -hmm. if it's the far end of the peninsula and somebody fell down with a stroke or something. But this to me, if we have these all over. Now, um, this government, um, I served three and a half terms on the board. I'm not on it now. I decided to go down to school in. But uh, they inspected us with a fine tooth comb, uh, a doctor, an accountant, a social worker, and raked us through and couldn't find anything we were doing wrong. It's a cheap and excellent way of serving people. But mm -hmm. here is my ideal of mm -hmm. progress for the whole of Canada. Every town yeah. has its kind of village and there is a wonderful atmosphere here. Um, before I was here, they fought about zoning. We're not full of high-rises like the West End of Vancouver because of this. Mm -hmm. You have village concern if there's something they're worried about, that's the place to, to, go. to go. So that's what you'd like to see. That's what well, I'd like to see. Um, as you look back over your, your career, uh, Claire, I wonder if there's accomplishments of which you're particularly, uh, about which you're particularly pleased. Well, I think many of the volunteer uh, kind of uh, activities. I worked for years on a committee in Vancouver, don't even ask me its name. Uh, it was uh, studying an area, what we used to call South Vancouver. Yeah, I guess it came under community chest and councils. So, uh, it was looking at the duplication and overlapping of service, the kind of family with about seven people going into it, public health nurses, probation officer, social workers, you know, <laughs> from several agencies, uh, city social assistance mm -hmm. and family service and children's aid and all. A very elaborate project to show that there was far too much overlap. <laughs> I guess we've still got it. That's an ongoing concern, but... Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes to uh, to have uh, gone in, I I don't know. I, uh, I overlapping when I got in the Gulf Islands, I got on the Gulf Islands school board, and uh, when I was living on Galliano, I met on Salt Spring, different school board, the four outer islands. I found that very interesting to be at that end after being at the social work end. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, I've always been involved in a in a, a variety of things. I don't know. I think whatever you're interested in at the moment is <laughs> is, is interesting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I, I've always uh, got involved in you know community affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, again, sort of a, a retrospective question, although there may be some currency to it too. I'm wondering what it has meant to you to be a professional social worker. Well, I, I suppose uh, 
I'm glad I made that choice as against the fact that I might have continued in teaching and I guess the idea of uh, teaching large groups of people, the kind of teaching I, uh, I, I once uh, pinch hit a course on administration of social agencies in a hurry, but I didn't really do any classroom teaching when I was at school social work, apart from, from that. But I think I'm, I'm glad that I went into social work because I think there are many areas of social work, some of which I have been involved in. For instance, when you're working in the hospital, you get uh, interested in mental health and uh, you know, the, such a variety of settings. Uh, but I, I think I said earlier, actually, among what I did, I, I found the sort of um, excitement of child protection, if you could get movement, you know, it, it, it was, you, know, you did family case work too, problems and stuff, and I, I think I rather liked that about it, although I liked it <laughs> mm -hmm. about as well as any direct service thing I ever did. Okay, well I wonder if in closing then there's anything you'd like to add or any topic I didn't bring up that you'd like to talk about? No, I don't know. I, I, I suppose really the, the need at the moment, the pressure on our government I see it in terms, if they don't care very much about schools and people. Down here we've been cutting cutting staff. Across the street they've been cutting staff with the budget cuts and the health end and human resources end. That somehow professionals have to be able to prove what I think is true. If you don't care about the kids and if you don't care about the old people, don't care about the families and just care about your full pocketbook. It is very costly to cut services because it's going to cost you a lot more in the end. There's going to be more broken families, more broken health, more problems. And somehow we have to be able to show that. We're not, we're not able to do it through the Social Workers Association. Or the nurses associations or other professionals or the teachers. Is it that we can't prepare the case or that we can't present it? I suppose <laughs> the time and energy from very busy jobs, especially now that people have uh, bigger workloads because of staff cuts, and anyhow we could find the money to do it, to get the people really to understand what do you do when there is a complaint of and how slow the work is and the skill it takes. You don't twist the child out of the home. You don't turn your back on it and go once a month. You know, mm -hmm. that it's, but it saves in the end. Mm -hmm. Saves money, saves family, saves kids. Again, with the, with the uh, older people, we now have uh, homemaker services, but these, uh, these cuts are being made, you see, which will keep people in their homes. One of the great things in this community of Victoria is the, uh, the uh, enormously heavy older population. Cologne is another place in BC which is interesting with a very heavy population mm -hmm. of old people. And uh, we have enormous waiting lists to get into facilities. And if we're cutting down on the homemaker service and so on, we have many people um, occupying acute care beds here who cannot be turfed out because there isn't room for the cheaper care. This means uh, waiting lists. I'm very sensitive. You've just been through a waiting list for people needing an acute care bed, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are a kind of issues which are known to social workers in various kinds of settings at the correction end. I knew a chap in Vancouver, a probation officer. He was doing a dandy job. That, People say probation doesn't work. They were so understaffed, he had to cover a good deal of the Fraser Valley, and all the time he really had was to do pre-sentence reports for magistrates and judges. And then he never had time to do the probation work, so probation doesn't work. You see what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, I, I think maybe we need to hire not the kind of publicity experts about the old English court judge, you see. Yeah. yeah, referring to the yeah, British what, what, money. Yeah, what social workers do, what social mm -hmm. workers do. Yeah. Well, the, the association somehow, a specialization in, uh, uh, I suppose it may be that some of the voluntary agencies um, mental retardation, some of these people, large groups, do actually have published to people, some of the national organizations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need to make our case better then. Mm. Yeah. Well, Claire, I'd like to thank you very much for the time that you spent with us this morning. I really enjoyed it and uh, learned a lot more about the development of social welfare and the profession in British Columbia. Your time is much appreciated. Well, I think it's, you're having great fun going around, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Oh, you're, you'll be so hungry. <laughs> Starvation silly. You must take a snack with you when you go That's on right. it. Thank you for the crackers and cream cheese. Have another before.